All right, guys, let's talk about the Constitutional Convention. And the way we talk about our Constitutional Convention is this is a meeting for our nation's future. So, what major event occurred in 1787 that caused the Americans to reconsider their government system? Well, if you guess Shays Rebellion, you are correct. But why did Shays Rebellion inspire changes to our U.S. government? Our government was too weak. And that makes us need some change. So, but what kind of changes are we going to talk about here? Some people thought it would be a good idea to simply revise or edit the Articles of Confederation. Others thought we needed a complete overhaul and brand new government entirely. So, which side do you think is more efficient? So the Constitutional Convention. Congress agreed that the Articles of Confederation needed improvements to strengthen the national government. In May of 1787, the Constitutional Convention meets in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania State House. We now refer to this building as Independence Hall. Twelve out of the 13 states sent delegates or representatives. Rhode Island did not send delegates because it feared the small states would lose power. Stop and add these highlighted information to your digital notebook. So I want you to take a minute and look at this picture here. And what do you think the artist meant by this picture? United we stand, divided we fall. So let's set the stage. We're at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the year is 1787. So the Constitutional Convention, 1787 in Pennsylvania. All right. So here we have assembled the best and the brightest to come up with a solution for our government. We really are the best group for this. We're all educated, wealthy, and have government experience. Hey now, we're all all-stars. Get your game on. Go play. Stop singing this instant. Let's call ourselves the framers. The Constitution we write will be the framework for our U.S. government. Some of the leaders of the Constitutional Convention. Here we have James Madison. He is known as the father of the Constitution. He was a very well-known Federalist. He helped Hamilton write the Federalist Papers. And he is one of the creators of the Virginia Plan. Next, we have George Washington. He was elected to be the president of the Constitutional Convention. Now, don't get that confused with president of the United States, because at this time, we are still under the Articles of Confederation, and we do not have a president. But he was elected to be president of the actual convention itself. And there were some folks that weren't at the convention. So the first, O.T. Jeff. He's been off in Paris for so long, right? That comes from that Hamilton cast. He was an ambassador to France. We have John Adams. He was an ambassador to Great Britain. And then, oh, I smell a rat, Patrick Henry. He refused to attend the convention. Remember, this convention is a closed door meeting. The convention was held where the rooms were closed door and closed window in order to preserve the privacy of the meeting. Compromise. Both sides give in a bit to reach an agreement. Got to give a little to get a little. So, just want to warn you, the following conversations are completely true and not edited, paraphrased, or dramatized at all by the Blaylock U.S. History Department. And by true, we mean we totally made up this dialogue, but we imagine this is how it's happened. So just go with it, okay? 
So I propose we have a strong central government. Whoa, are you crazy? We need a weak one. We don't want another tyrant. Are you dumb? A weak government is what got us into this mess in the first place. But if we give the federal government all the power, they're going to take advantage of us. Literally, the only way I'll even consider ratifying this blasted constitution is if we add something to protect our rights. A Bill of Rights? Blasphemy! This constitution already protects our rights enough. The hall explodes in angry shouting. There has to be a way to stop this bickering, or this is going to be a long convention. So this takes us to the Anti-Federalist and the Federalist. So, the Federalists, in favor of a strong central government. They wrote the Federalist Papers. Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison are their most notable leaders. And they opposed the addition of a Bill of Rights. On the other side, you have the Anti-Federalists who opposed a strong central government. They wrote the Anti-Federalist Papers. George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry are their notable leaders. And they saw the Bill of Rights as essential to protecting the rights of the people of this country. Add this info to your digital notebook. The Federalist Papers. Alexander Hamilton joined forces with John Jay and James Madison in an agreement where each would write a series of 25 essays defending the brand new United States Constitution. The work divided evenly between the three men. In the end, they wrote 85 over the span of six months. John Jay got six after writing five of those essays. James Madison stepped up wrote 29, so he added another 4 for J. But Hamilton wrote the other 51 essays. Man, the man is non-stop, right? So the solution? The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had to compromise with one another. The Constitution was ratified, giving the central government much more power than it did before. But a Bill of Rights was added to protect the individual freedoms of citizens, as well as the rights of the states. What amendment was added to protect the rights of the states? The Tenth. The Tenth Amendment is the amendment that was protected to add or to protect the rights of the states. The Anti-Fed, Fed Compromise. The Constitution was ratified, but a Bill of Rights was added to. Please stop and add this information to your digital notebook. Your anchor chart for Fed versus Anti-Fed, you got them down there, boxing it out. A for the Anti-Feds, F for the Federalists. One empty seat representing that Rhode Island did not show up for the convention. All is well now, right? No, 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 he says, right? All representation in Congress should be based on population. Um, no, we small states will literally never, ever get a say. Mo people, mo problems. That's what I always say. We large states need more representation. If you ask me, it should be equal representation across the board. And how will equal be fair to those large states exactly? The hall explodes in more angry shouting. Uh, I think I feel a headache coming on. So the Virginia plan. I have a huge population. So this was created by James Madison and Edmund Randolph. Plan to set up a bicameral or two-house legislature. Representation would be based on population. The more people who lived in a state, the more representation they would get in Congress. Stop and add the highlighted info to your digital notebook. Is this plan both fair and equal? 
the New Jersey plan. I have a tiny population created by William Patterson, plan to set up a unicameral legislature or a one-house legislature. Representation would be equal across all states in Congress. Each state would have one representative regardless of state size. Please stop and add the highlighted information to your digital notebook. Is this plan both fair and equal? Ah, a bright idea, huh? So what is our solution? The great compromise is the solution. Let's take both ideas and push them together. So, the Virginia plan, Madison and Randolph, three branches of government, bicameral or two-house legislature, proportional representation. In other words, both houses would be filled with representatives based on the state's population. On the other side, the New Jersey plan, Patterson, also three branches of government, but just a unicameral or one house legislature with equal representation. Each state would have the same one representative. So what is the Great Compromise? It's also known as the Connecticut Compromise, created by Roger Sherman, and he proposed three branches of government, just like Virginia and New Jersey did with the executive, legislative, and judicial. He proposed a bicameral legislature, much like the Virginia plan, but where he differs is, he says, hey, why don't we make the upper house the Senate and we'll give each state equal representation or two senators per state. So that's one more senator per state than what the New Jersey plant would offer. And then he says, let's make the other house, the lower house, which is the House of Representatives. And in this house, we will make our representation proportional based on the state's population. So add the circled information to your digital notebook. Your anchor chart for the Great Compromise. Remember the upper house is the Senate and has equal representation. Remember that the Senate is to make the small states happy. So if you think about the Senate and think about how that word starts with the letter S and small states, okay, so small Senate, equal representation. And then the lower house, the House of Representatives, has population-based representation. The Great Compromise created a bicameral two-house legislature. Okay, so we've established compromises between the idea of big and small government, as well as representation for small and large states. That has to be it, right? Absolutely not. We Northerners propose that slaves be counted for taxation purposes. The South needs to pull their fair share of the financial burdens of this country. Oh, well, what? No. The South thinks that the slaves should, should, however, be counted for representation purposes. Why on earth would they count towards your population count for representation? What a joke. You don't treat them like people, so why would we let you benefit from counting them as people? Well, if you think that, why would you be okay with counting them for taxation purposes? Um, there is a huge difference between having to pay for owning slaves and rigging the system to benefit yourself. The hall explodes in even more angry shouting. Can we just stop the bickering? So, the North. Lower slave population wanted slaves to count only for taxation purposes. The more slaves the state had, the more their taxes should increase to help pay off the national debt. South, very high slave population, wanted slaves to count only for representational purposes. The more slaves the state had, 
the more representatives they should have in Congress since their population is higher. So please stop and add this information to your digital notebook. Solution? Well, we get the three-fifth compromise. So the three-fifth compromise says that for every five slaves in the population, only three of them would count. The count would be towards both taxation, which is making the North happy, and representation, making the South happy. This does not mean that each slave was counted as three-fifths of a person. It means that for every five slaves, only three were counted. And then that very last piece of the three-fifths compromise, they say that the issue of slavery was put off for discussion for another 20 years. Just stop and think about that one. Why would the framers not want to discuss the topic of slavery for another 20 years? Please stop and add the highlighted info to your digital notebook. So why do you think the framers put off the discussion of slavery for another 20 years? So we have an anchor chart for the three-fifths compromise. Out of every five slaves, three would count for population. They were counted for both taxation and representation purposes. Feds versus anti-feds. Small versus large. North versus South. Okay. Now can we ratify the Constitution already? Tune in next week to find out for sure if the Constitution was approved.